Hi, my name is Sagi Volkov. I work for uh, Red Hat as a storage performance instigator in the cloud storage and data services business unit. Welcome to my KubeCon session, whatever co can go wrong, will go wrong, Rukunsef and storage failures. In our session uh, agenda, I'll talk a little bit about uh, kind of a storage introduction. Um, I'll explain a few resiliency terms that are commonly used in the uh, storage uh, industry. We'll talk about uh, Ceph as a storage provider, Rook as a storage orchestrator or manager of uh, storage. Uh, we'll talk about failures. Um, supposed to be a live demo, it's gonna be a recorded demo. And I'll leave time for uh, questions uh, in the end. So, storage, we all uh, you need it, we all use it every day. It might be ephemeral or it might be persistent. Uh, of course, the discussion today is just on the uh, persistent storage in uh, uh, Kubernetes. Let's do a little bit of an overview of uh, storage. Uh, up until like 10 years ago, what we used to have is storage arrays, these giants, uh, giant uh, uh, bare metal arrays of many drives in it, and they would uh, uh, connect uh, into bare metal uh, nodes or, or virtual machine. Um, not a lot of uh, dynamic in allocation of uh, 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 volumes. Then about 10 years ago, sto uh, software defined storage or SDS uh, started to be uh, big. Um, we start to see the, uh, the ability to have uh, servers have uh, the, uh, the ability to uh, run some sort of a software that provides storage to a, a cluster of servers or a set of servers uh, in a manner that we, uh, it, it, it was still uh, stable, resilient, and uh, redundant. Um, uh, Software-defined storage is uh, probably the most common uh, storage used in uh, Kubernetes nowadays. You can use it in a con uh, converged manner where we have um, um, uh, our nodes running the software-defined storage and our pods. And you can also use it in a non-converged manner where we have some nodes running the pods, the application pods, and some nodes are just running uh, the software-defined uh, storage uh, pods. So let's talk about a few terms that are widely used in the storage world. Uh, of course, um, they are also used in a lot of uh, processes in the technology world and outside of the technology world. Availability is basically your uh, uptime. In the storage uh, uh, domain, you're going to hear a lot about the number of nines that a storage uh, solution uh, has. Uh, that's basically uh, 99 point uh, nine nine something nines, uh, which basically impact the availability of your storage. The number of nines after the dot, uh, six nines is equivalent um, to thirty one thirty one seconds of downtime uh, in one year. Five nines is about five minutes. Four nines is about one hour, and three nines is about uh, nine hours of uh, downtime in one year. Durability is, uh, like the name, uh, basically how durable is your storage, uh, how good is it is in, in, in keeping the data. The data might not be accessible all the time, um, but it is still intact. So, for example, you lost a, a, a data center, um, the data still resides uh, or, you, or you hope still resides on your uh, storage solution. When the data setter comes back up, the data is still there. Uh, reliability and resiliency, two terms that we are uh, going to uh, be focusing uh, more here. Um, basically, a probability, you know, of how good you design your storage solution. And, and basically, it, it gets impacted by uh, the ability of your storage solution to heal itself. So again, we lost a storage device, or maybe we lost a node with a, a few storage devices, uh, or a data center or a switch. Um, it's the ability for the storage solution to heal itself and to continue and provide uh, uh, the services, the data services that it needs to uh, provide. 
in this diagram I'm trying to kind of uh, um, explain these uh, uh, terms with a couple of uh, processes. Of course, we want availability and durability all the time uh, throughout all the processes. Uh, we have process Z that starts and in the end of the process basically uh, inserts, uh, each process uh, inserts 10 rows into some sort of a database. If uh, the process ran 100 times, we're supposed to see in the end uh, a 1,000 rows in the database. Uh, if we're seeing that, that's uh, basically 100% availability. If we're seeing 950, it's basically 95% availability. Uh, of course, th throughout the process, once we in insert the data, we want the data to be durable. We always want to be able to query it. Uh, uh, some, in some cases, uh, um, in the storage domain, there's a, a term called retention policy. Maybe you only need it for one night. Maybe you only need the data for one year, maybe just for 10 minutes. But as long as uh, for the duration of your retention policy that you define for that uh, piece of uh, data, uh, you need to be able to uh, to to have durability, 100% durability throughout this uh, re retention time. Um, and then, you know, once process Z ends, process Y uh, starts to read input from uh, process Z and, and, and run uh, uh, some other uh, processes as well. Throughout all this time, reliability and resiliency uh, is a must. Again, you lost a node, you lost a device, you lost a switch. We want to be able to continue and run process Z and run process Y and complete them successfully. That's basically how reliable our, uh, our stored solution. And even and if we are able to uh, complete these processes while losing some uh, 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 some sort of uh, data storage uh, capabilities that shows up how good our resiliency is. So let's continue with a couple of more terms. MTTR, or mean time to repair, a very common uh, uh, used uh, terminology that is uh, directly connected to your uh, resiliency. You had a problem, we talked about it, you lost a storage device, you know, it's usually either a, a drive or flash device or, or a, an old array of storage or switch, um, and how easy your storage uh, solution is actually uh, um, repairing uh, itself. Yeah, when the storage uh, defined uh, software world, um, you can uh, sometimes define uh, decides between having uh, two copies of your data versus uh, three copies of your data. For example, if you have two copies of your data and for some reason you lost some devices and you now only have valid um, uh, one copy of the data, until you actually repair and go back into 100% resiliency, 100% two copies you are basically exposing yourself uh, to uh, data uh, unavailability if you lost more devices and now your only copy that exists is also not available. So MTTR is uh, very important uh, for uh, your resiliency. Um, in the SDS world, um, we talked a little bit about converge uh, uh, infrastructure versus uh, non-converge. Um, converge can be uh, more uh, more concern uh, in how you design and how you spread your data versus when you separate actually compute in a uh, storage uh, uh, nodes um, mesh of course especially in SDS is a big help um, um, software defined storage solutions like Ceph thrive on mesh thrive on having a lot of nodes with a lot of devices the more devices you have the faster you can actually recover from a loss of a device. Another term is uh, MTBF, mean time between uh, failures. Uh, basically, everything comes down into the quality of the devices that you use uh, to store uh, to store your data. 
Um, so this measurement is basically um, the between time be uh, from the last failure to the next failure of a device or or, or a storage system. Uh, just for you know example, uh, an, an enterprise grade uh, drive have about uh, eight hundred thousand hours of MTBF, which is roughly uh, ninety years. Sounds uh, a lot, but then if your storage solution have ninety drives. In that example, that basically means that you're going to have one failure every year. If your stored solution have or data center uh, uh, have 900 drives, basically means that you're going to have a, a failure every five weeks in one of uh, the drives, one of the 900 uh, drives. So you need a very good um, uh, software above the devices to actually. Uh, make sure that you still have availability. That's where the two copies of the data, uh, three copies, erasure coding of spreading the data across all the devices. Uh, that's where all these things uh, uh, come into play. So last couple of terms, uh, RTO, recovery time objective, basically how long can your process or your company or data center can survive without access to data? Uh, usually, this uh, your RTO needs to be as uh, short as possible. Um, you define this uh, usually by uh, by tiers uh, in in uh, enterprise organization. Some applications cannot have a, a no access, for example, uh, no more than five minutes in one year or uh, thirty seconds in uh, uh, one year. Other applications are in lower tiers and yeah, it's fine for them to not have access to the data for, you know, one day uh, uh, in a year. RPO is your recovery point uh, objective. Um, besides counting on your storage solution to uh, maintain all the copies and run all the time and provide adequate uh, performance, you should always uh, thrive to do also run backups outside of this uh, storage solution. And this basically uh, uh, impact your uh, RPO, uh, how many backups you have in case you lost everything in your storage solution will basically impact your uh, recovery point object objective. If you run a backup every uh, one hour, that means that uh, uh, your RPO is of uh, uh, one hour. All right, so now uh, let's continue and uh, start to talk about Ceph and Rook. Um, Ceph is a, a unified storage system, uh, software-defined storage. It's been around for a long time. Um, it provides basically the ability to have object and block and file, a file from a CephFS, which is basically in the Kubernetes world, will be the equivalent of a, a the RWX. Uh, it's a shareable size, uh, file system. Uh, RBD is a, a, a pure block device, and RGW is the ability to interact with object uh, using a, a S3, for example. There are a few components uh, uh, for uh, for Ceph. Uh, the Ceph Mon or the monitor um, is basically uh, um, um, the the coordination or to co the coordinator of uh, uh, all data and components in, in, in the cluster. Uh, it's using a uh, Paxos to keep itself alive. There's minimum of three of these uh, uh, processes in a cluster, and you can go up to uh, seven. Uh, the manager uh, mainly concentrate on on uh, real time uh, metrics um, and uh, other management uh, uh, functions that are for the Ceph uh, cluster. There's uh, one active, and you can go to have one active and one uh, standby. Ceph OSDs these uh, are very important uh, processes. These are basically the uh, a process that uh, attached into a a, a a device that can provide storage like an HDD, SDD, NVMe, any type of a, a block device. And then in return, the Ceph cluster aggregates all these devices, create pools out of them, and able to provide uh, the, the storage capabilities for the clients, in our case, uh, uh, Kubernetes and, and uh, uh, PVCs whether it's an object, a block, or, uh, or a file. A couple of other processes that are not showing up here on the presentation. RGW is basically what allows uh, for object storage access. Um, 
usually starts with the one process and if you need to scale up to you know millions of uh, accesses or millions of object accesses you can add more uh, mds is the ability basically to uh, access as ffs um, y you start with uh, two of these processes one is uh, um, active and one in a standby uh, uh, mode and now let's uh, talk about uh, uh, Rook. Uh, um, the Rook is a, basically a, a storage manager for Kubernetes. In our case, we use it uh, with uh, Ceph. I like to call it the orchestrator of uh, all things. As you can see on uh, these slides, anything blue is kind of uh, more on the Rook level. We have the Rook and Ceph uh, operator. It's a pod that runs in one of the nodes. Um, we have discovery pods that runs on any uh, node that we would like to, uh, uh, that will provide storage that have like block devices that Ceph, the Ceph cluster is going to uh, to use. You can you configure you config, configure these by uh, labels and taints and things like that. The Ceph CSI uh, uh, level are basically the attacher. Uh, and uh, detach attach uh, uh, pods that exist on uh, uh, every node, whether it's for uh, a block or for CFFS. Um, and then you have the Ceph daemons uh, that uh, Rook is uh, controlling. Um, of course, uh, uh, each of these things are, are basically uh, pods. You have uh, uh, mon pods uh, that runs on. Uh, you have three minimum of three uh, mon pods. So on the next node uh, that we don't uh, show up in this slide, uh, we don't necessarily have a mon pod. Um, OSDs will actually uh, we will have OSDs wherever we will uh, have storage that we consume uh, on these nodes. Uh, we talked about RGWs. We talked about the manager having one of them. MDS. Um, there's a pod here for uh, a mirroring of RBD to a different uh, Rook Ceph cluster on a completely different Kubernetes uh, cluster and crash collector in case uh, things go bad and we need to uh, collect uh, all kinds of uh, logs. So let's talk about uh, Rook and Ceph uh, resilience in uh, Kubernetes. Yeah, uh, as discussed previously, every uh, Ceph process is basically uh, a pod. So we want to understand uh, 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 what happens when a pod uh, fails. Going back to all the terminology that we use, you know, of course, this impacts our uh, resiliency. Um, so, you know, the MONs are uh, very important uh, uh, processes. That's why we have three of them that spread over uh, uh, three nodes uh, or more. Uh, the MDS, which uh, uh, again provides access to uh, CFS, we have uh, a minimum of two. Uh, one is in an active, uh, active mode and one in standby uh, mode. Um, none of the MONs or the MGL, the manager processes uh, of Ceph are actually in the data path when we uh, uh, access it uh, using a, a, a RBD, for example. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, uh, RPOs and, and, and backup and, and, and uh, durability. If you have two data centers, you have two Kubernetes uh, uh, clusters, you can uh, uh, use uh, Ceph built-in replication, uh, such as the Ceph RBD mirroring, to basically mirror a PV, a PV uh, in a certain pool from uh, one Ceph cluster in Kubernetes uh, cluster A to a, a Rook Ceph cluster in Kubernetes uh, cluster B. Um, Ceph also offer uh, the same capabilities for uh, uh, object storage. It is GA in uh, the Ceph project. Uh, it's still uh, uh, not a GA in uh, Rook. It will be GA in, in the next uh, 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 one or two releases. So let's talk about um, uh, some demos that uh, I want to show. We're going to look at a few scenarios, um, basically of uh, OSD pods uh, failures and how Rook and Ceph uh, behave. Um, what we're basically going to do is uh, constantly create uh, stress on the uh, storage solution, in our case, uh, Rook and Ceph. Uh, and then uh, one scenario will be um, 
when a, a, a developer or an admin or person delete by mistake an OSD pod, what happens? Um, what happens when you uh, reboot a node that have uh, OSDs, uh, OSD pods uh, on it? Remember, OSD uh, is the process that consume uh, a block device on a node and then uh, uh, is part of the whole uh, Ceph a, a cluster a, a that then provides storage to our uh, Kubernetes application. We're also going to look at what happens when we uh, lose uh, one of the devices that the uh, OSD pods uh, is uh, using. Um, I've, all this demo is running on a AWS, very uh, small cluster. There's like uh, three masters. There's going to be three nodes that are going to run Rook and Ceph and provide the storage and three nodes that are going to run uh, uh, applications uh, that will consume and stress uh, the storage. Uh, I'm using uh, a, a project named Sherlock, which I started a couple of months ago. Uh, it's basically a, um, uh, a project that aims to um, um, check and test and stress uh, performance on uh, all sorts of uh, uh, stored solution uh, in the Kubernetes uh, domain. Uh, so you can run it uh, not only on Rook and Ceph, but on uh, uh, any other uh, SDS uh, provider. Uh, I also collect uh, uh, statistical information from um, the actual nodes uh, that provide the storage and the nodes that uh, consume the storage. So you can uh, take a look at that as well. And let's move into the demos. All right, so let's for, uh, start the first uh, demo. I've kind of sl split my uh, terminal into four sections. Hopefully it's uh, clear. On the uh, top right uh, section, I have a Ceph command called uh, CephOSD3 that is uh, uh, constantly running using a watch. Um, it basically shows the Ceph cluster uh, um, uh, OSD3, as the command says. We can see that we have three nodes that uh, provide the storage. On each of the nodes, we have uh, two uh, uh, OSDs that uh, uh, consume uh, two SSD devices on them and provide it back into the uh, Ceph cluster. On the top left, I have a kubectl command uh, looking at uh, the pods that exist on the Rook Ceph namespace. I am uh, uh, only grabbing for the uh, OSD pods. These are the ones that we are uh, uh, interested in. As we can see, uh, we have uh, th uh, six uh, OSDs on the uh, uh, top right, and we have six OSD pods on the top left. Uh, I have a project called uh, MySQL. It has 12 databases, uh, 12 MySQL pods uh, running on these uh, three uh, uh, nodes. Um, each uh, uh, MySQL database is uh, uh, using a 100 gigabyte uh, PVC. I also have uh, 12 sysbench uh, jobs uh, or sysbench uh, pods running uh, on, uh, on these uh, 12 MySQL databases. And um, uh, this is done, of course, using the Sherlock uh, GitHub project that I've uh, previously uh, mentioned. I'm just going to pick one of these, uh, you know, one of these nodes, one of these uh, MySQL uh, uh, jobs, and I'm going to uh, um, basically um, constantly monitor the logs of uh, this uh, job. As you can see, it's a typical uh, Syspench output every 10 seconds shows like the number of transactions per second, uh, latency, and uh, uh, things uh, uh, like that. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick one of these uh, um, uh, basically uh, uh, OSD pods and um, I will uh, uh, delete uh, one of them. Um, in this case, I'm just going to pick uh, OSD uh, 3. And what is uh, uh, interesting to uh, monitor is to uh, look at um, the uh, top left um, of what happens to the pod. I kill it if a new one comes in. And on the uh, 
uh, top right um, since we are looking at uh, uh, OSD3 that's OSD3 right here what is uh, um, what is happening to the the status of that uh, uh, OSD component is it uh, staying up uh, for how long there's another uh, command here uh, from uh, Ceph that basically dumping all the uh, uh, PGs or placement groups that uh, the Ceph cluster has. As you can see now, we have 81 pages and they're all at uh, all at an active and a clean. If Ceph uh, uh, see uh, uh, that something is wrong with one of the OSDs, uh, maybe we need to uh, recover one of uh, the OSDs. You're gonna see that on uh, on this uh, dump command. All right, so let's uh, dump. Uh, let's uh, delete uh, the pod and see what's uh, happening. So the pod is uh, uh, deleted. You can see it's uh, uh, terminated. You can see that there's already a, a new uh, a OSD3 pod uh, started and it's already up and running. Um, OSD3 was marked here as down for, uh, uh, you know, one or two seconds. And as you can see from the uh, uh, dumping of the pages in here, that Ceph is uh, uh, working in making sure that uh, the new OSD pod that is using basically the same device as previously has a, a all the right uh, placement groups and uh, uh, all the pages are uh, clean and as you can see all the placement groups sorry, are clean and as you can see everything went back into uh, um, uh, normal state in, in terms of uh, how Ceph uh, behaves. You can also see how in the uh, output of uh, Sysbench um, you can see that uh, right here you can see how uh, there was uh, a little bit of a drop in the uh, IOPS uh, that the, uh, this uh, Sysbench job uh, was running and that is uh, of course acceptable there was some kind of uh, um, an I/O operation that internally Ceph uh, was doing um, this database uh, might have been reading from uh, placement groups that was on the OSD that I have uh, uh, deleted so for a brief second it had to uh, get the pages from um, a different uh, OSD that's uh, uh, that's the job of the Ceph uh, Mons to basically tell all the clients uh, to get these pages from uh, a, a, a different uh, a location and that's the end of this uh, first uh, demo. All right, so let's uh, uh, do our second demo, same setup. What I'm going to do is actually uh, now um, reboot one of the nodes uh, that are running Rook and Ceph. Uh, so, which basically means that uh, since each node have two OSDs and we have total of six uh, OSDs, we are basically taking down uh, a third of our uh, storage um, for, uh, for a brief time. I'm going to pick um, this node and let me start um, monitoring one of the uh, Sysbench pods. And two for three is number eight. And I'm going to uh, reboot uh, this node. And on the bottom left, I'm going to look at the, uh, the node status. Uh, since this is AWS, things are probably uh, you know, rebooting so fast. I'm not sure how much of uh, uh, a cube cutter is actually going to capture that the nodes are being down. But as you can see on the bottom, on the top uh, right, uh, Ceph uh, does uh, definitely starts to see some uh, PGs that are not available. It's marking the OSDs as uh, down, starting to uh, um, um, make sure that um, it's uh, uh, understand where it needs to move these uh, pages. Uh, that were primary on these nodes and now on the uh, top left you can see that we have two uh, new OSD pods uh, uh, starting and once they are going to be uh, up and running on the top right we're going to see uh, that um, uh, OSD 1 and 4 they are now marked as up 
and peering process is starting in Ceph and it's starting to uh, move uh, whatever pages it needs back into uh, uh, into those uh, new OSDs that just uh, uh, came up. Now again, this is a third of uh, the storage. And uh, as you can see, um, we are uh, uh, looking at uh, the logs of uh, uh, Sysbench. Um, there was a, um, a brief time that um, uh, we didn't see any uh, transaction. Transaction were uh, were basically uh, paused or have uh, higher latencies, uh, but now everything uh, continues. So these were basically the two demos, um, um, replacing uh, new devices uh, for uh, OSDs is basically the same thing as the last de uh, demo that I I've shown. Ceph is going to uh, uh, have these new devices part of the uh, OSDs and then uh, move all the placement groups uh, uh, into or respread the placement groups using these devices as well. I will now answer um, any questions that uh, you guys might have and thanks for uh, attending my session.